It is, it's me, it's TRG, the Ramblin' Gambler. Rings, blings, and all the small things. This is episode 58 of our Casino Combat Podcast. If this is your first time or your next time, thank you very much for taking some time and spending it with me today. I will get this episode started after what might be the most important part of the podcast. Grognak and the Silver Shroud, non-binary persons. Ladies and gentlemen, only gamble with money you can afford to lose. Do not gamble with money you need to pay your bills. My past performances are not indicative of anyone's future results, including my own. If you have a gambling problem, contact your local problem gambling hotline. If you do not know how to contact your problem gambling hotline, send an email to help at casinocombat.com. We will find that information for you. We will make it available to you. Everything I'm going to share with you in this podcast is based in fact. Names and dates have been ordered to the innocent and the guilty minor items unrelated outcomes may be omitted for the purpose of clarity and brevity absolutely clarity and brevity there we go that is certainly what we are all about let's get episode 58 started what do we need to cover today um okay i think i'm gonna stick with the basics standard layout go all the way back to how we've always done it way back in the beginning i'm gonna do a core concept segment and look at an advanced aspect of casino point management we're going to have a moment of casino wisdom, and I'm going to share a brand new casino wisdom with you. I've said in the past that growing up, I read dozens of books about heroes and crooks, and I learned much from both of their styles. So being as honest as I can be, a lot of gamblers would tell you this wisdom teaches you crook behavior. I'll let you decide that. I'm going to recommend something I do in casinos that a lot of other gamblers think is a bad idea. They think it's bad form. They think it's bad etiquette. But it's something that I do. It's something I think you should do. I have some interesting stories about it and around it. And I think that should make a a very interesting moment of casino wisdom. Um, Of course, I did some gambling last week, both locally and uh, finished up the week with Mrs. TRG and and a long weekend at that great Caesars property that, uh, that we like. I'll share our results and probably some observations in our normal travel segment. As always, we will finish up in the virtual VIP lounge with some sips and a story. A story that is kind of the origin of today's casino wisdom. I think you will find it funny and or ironic. Probably a little bit of both. It's certainly funny. It's just weird how things work out. So we'll do that in the virtual VIP lounge. As far as news from the Casino Combat universe, I have just a couple quick things to update you on. Gabriel ended up embroiled in Drinkgate once again, somewhat surprisingly last week, with two different bartenders once again charging two different prices for the same drink made the same way. It's not that it's a big deal. It's it's not that the money's a big deal. It's the idea that he's a regular guest. He should know what to expect. The thing should be standard. It's just poor casino management that you have two bartenders at two different bars less than 50 yards from each other making the same drink and deciding on their own to charge two different prices. So he ended up speaking with the day shift food and beverage manager, and and hopefully this matter is resolved. What she told him was if there was ever a problem again to tell any member of her team that she had discussed the matter with him, that this was his drink served his way at his price, which is pretty generous of her. She's what he's welcome to use her name to get this resolved in the future if he needs to. And she promised if he has any more issues, she's going to add a button to the point of sale system, literally labeled Gabriel's drink with the correct pricing. So a different kind of casino combat for Gabriel last week. And hopefully he won the battle this time. Hopefully he won the war this time, not just the battle. Hopefully this is behind him. Although it would be really fun. You know, I, I'd be jealous, actually. I mean, Gabriel has a button on the point-of-sale system for the entire casino that says, Gabriel's drink? That would be very cool. I kind of hope that happens, actually. Uh, Because then I could order Gabriel's drink and get the same price. In other news, good friend, friend of the podcast, The Walking Wikipedia, had a, 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 I'll call it, interesting experience gambling at our local casino last week. He went down to play because it was raining on Saturday. He couldn't play golf. He, he won some money at a table where he was told he shouldn't win money. He went to play some blackjack. He was playing with two other players that, in his opinion, didn't know how to play well enough to win. And in the process, the dealer remarks to him that she knew everyone was going to lose at that table today because she knew what algorithm the casino was using to, to program the automatic shufflers for the day. And players were just going to lose, get losing hands. That's just the way it was going to be because of the algorithm that the shuffler was using. 
So Walking Wikipedia is, is kind of stunned by this statement, that, that the dealer would say this, even if it's true that the dealer would say it is ridiculous, and unfortunately the other players at the table just, they were oblivious. They didn't really notice what the dealer had said, didn't see it as significant, didn't make a big deal about it. So without another credible, capable witness to this statement, you know, W.W. just didn't feel like he wanted to press the issue any further. He would have, I would have, if he and I had been there together, we'd have, frankly, we'd have filed something with the Gaming Commission, honestly, because we didn't want to make a big deal out of the fact that, A, this probably isn't true, and B, it shouldn't be said, particularly shouldn't be said if it is or isn't true. Um, but with just himself and, and two players that don't know enough to, to know this shouldn't and can't be true, he was just going to have a he said, she said if he tried to make a, a, an issue out of it, tried to make a point. Probably not, issue is the wrong word. If he tried to make a point of it, take it further, it would have just been his word against hers. But let's break this down just a little bit. First, as I said, both WW, Walking Wikipedia and I, we think this is just a dealer trying to impress players with big words. We don't really think the house is inputting different shuffle patterns to prearrange the card. The state gaming board's rules and procedures for blackjack clearly state that the cards will be randomly intermixed. Randomly intermixed is literally directly from the policies, procedures, and rules that govern this game in this state. I really doubt that the house would violate the state's rules in an attempt to cheat players at a $25 blackjack game. This is risking a multi-million dollar Gambling license, a monopoly on gambling in this region of this state to what? Take a few extra dollars of profit in a game that, that they already have a legal advantage? It makes no sense that they would risk doing this, risk breaking the rules, risk breaking the procedures to just get a few more dollars. They, they've got a license to print money as it is. In this particular property, the house uses Shuffle Master brand shufflers, the same kind used in Las Vegas and Atlantic City, where it is also illegal to use a machine that does not randomly shuffle the cards. Look, I'm not an expert on these machines. I've never seen the inside of them. I don't know how they're coded. I, I don't know what the house can and cannot do to them. And I do know that they can read the cards to make sure that no extra cards have been added or removed by sleight of hand on the player's part or by dealer's error. I've seen these machines display an error code when a card is missing. But a machine knowing the suit and value of each card is not the same as not randomly mixing the cards, of using that information from a computer programming point of view to position the cards in a certain order to create a player disadvantage. It seems to me that the shuffler would need to know how many players were at the table, how many hands they were going to play, how they were going to play their hands, and where the cut card was going to be placed by a random player. These are not continuous shuffle machines that are, that are putting new cards for the, for the dealer there all the time. These are machines that take a stack of eight decks, and then it shuffles that stack of eight decks while another stack of cards is being played. Then the shuffled cards come out of the machine, they're cut by a player to start the game. Between the time the cards were shuffled and the time they are used in play, players may have entered the game, players may have left the game. It makes no logical sense to me that it would be possible to arrange the cards in any meaningful way. So the house has no reason to do this, it's illegal to do this, and it seems unlikely that this can be done in a way that would be useful given how the game is run. So as far as continuing to gamble at this property, I'm not worried about this. It's sad to, that the dealer thought this was something acceptable to say to guests, something to brag about, some hidden knowledge to assert that she had, but that's about all it is. It's sad, but it's really not something that's concerning. Still, and honestly, an interesting and, and as I said, concerning story from the walking Wikipedia. Just other things going on out there in the world related to casino combat and our casino combat squad. Okay, we have a battle plan. We know what's been happening in the casino combat universe. Let's get started with a core concept segment. The core concepts are really just the fundamentals of being a good casino gambler. Fundamentals that with no social media, no YouTube, nothing but books and the school of hard knocks, it took me decades to sort out and conceptualize. 
But here we are today. Thanks to YouTube, I've put a playlist called Boot Camp on the Casino Combat YouTube page. And I say I have. T-Rex actually did it. <laughs> I recorded the words. He did all the hard parts. Uh, and I appreciate him for that. Him and Billy with the great last name who takes care of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, and all that kind of stuff for me. Uh, by the way, we spelled Boot Camp and Combat with a K as, as part of the, the, the YouTube page. The playlist covers all the core concepts in in detail in short 10 to 15 minute lessons you can learn the fundamentals of good casino gambling of being a good casino gambler in less than 90 minutes using that playlist it's one of the best legacies i think that that's come out of this podcast let me highlight here that i didn't say being a good blackjack player or being a good roulette player i said being a good casino gambler there are many aspects of being good at casino gambling that have very little to do with the gambling itself and I wanted to talk about one of those aspects today. One of the core concepts is to have and use a player's card. In practice, this seems very simple and straightforward, and in the most basic of ways, it is. You enter a casino, a new casino, that's part of a, a brand you've not gambled with previously. You go to the rewards or membership desk, whatever they call it. You give them ID, and they give you a player's card with an account number on it. Easy. And then you show that card anytime you're doing a transaction with the casino. The casino gives you points for that. So we show the casino our card when we enter a table game or when we purchase something and we earn points. And for most brands, there are different kinds of points. One kind of points determine your status or tier level with the brand, which determines the benefits that you receive from them automatically. These could be anything from a discount at the buffet to cutting the line at a restaurant to getting a free hotel room when you ask for it. Usually these benefits are earned a year at a time, but there are rewards systems where you earn status every six months or even every three months. There are also points earned that you can spend. Those are a different kind of points. And what those are called vary from brand to brand. Caesars calls them reward credits. M Life calls them express comps. My Choice calls them my cash. Different brands calls them different things. But regardless, this is tax-free money that you can spend at the casino or at the resort property outside the casino when you're a guest. For me, and I think it should be for you, something where managing these points is a key part of getting as much value as possible out of the relationship with the casino. I'll take you back to a recent example of ours. On our recent trip to Atlantic City, Mrs. TRG and I stopped at our home casino, Casino 2, as we headed east to Atlantic City. Basically, we left home a day early to shorten the drive by using a comped hotel stay. When we had dinner, I used my rewards card to get a 10% discount on the meal and then used my cash points, since it's a My Choice property, to pay for the meal. In my mind, that is free and tax-free money that paid for that meal. Being aware of your spendable points and managing them, managing when and how you spend them, is an important part of being good at casino gambling. And the when and how is going to be different for everyone, but the first step is to be aware of them and look for ways to exploit them. As an example of this, at my local casino, I try to keep my point balance really, really low. I want just enough money there to be able to use points for a brunch for Mrs. TRG and myself, or a quick snack, and I don't want a lot more points there. Honestly, I really don't trust them not to randomly just change the value or take away points, which is probably a bit paranoid, I'll admit, but that's where I am with things with that brand right now. They are a minor local brand. I'm not really concerned about Caesars or MGM suddenly changing things without notice. But a company with only two casinos in one city, they can make changes on the fly if they want to. And they've shown in the past that they're willing to. Anyway, if my point total at that brand starts to be hundreds of dollars, I draw it back down by gambling some of that value in a slot machine using TRG slot strategy number one. And I take whatever cash that creates. And I'm not going to re-explain TRG slot strategy number one to you, but I will remind you that if you want that slot strategy, as well as TRG slot strategy el numero dos, I've written it all down in, a, in an ebook for you. If you send an email to me, trg at casinocombat.com, spell combat with a K, of course, as always, put a K in there. And in the, and in the subject line, put two words, slot tactics. If you do that, send me the email. Um, the, the podcast email bot, Fred, will see that email, even if I'm not around, and will send you a link to download my book, Casino Combat Slot Tactics. 
and and just to throw this in there as well, we're going to have a casino wisdom later. Fred is a very smart e bot. T Rex and I did an excellent job programming Fred. If you put the two words "get wisdom" in the subject line, Fred will send you a link to download a full list of all the casino wisdoms and the first episode where I discussed them. Back on topic. I keep my points at this brand very low. My spendable points, I keep them very, very low. I try to keep them around 50, 75 bucks. Gabriel, on the other hand, does things completely differently. He has a stunning amount of imaginary tax-free money in his account. Thousands and thousands, not hundreds of dollars. As a result of that, he's well positioned. Anytime he wants to go to a concert, a sporting event, go out to a fancy restaurant that's in, in, in our downtown area, he's got the, the imaginary money to do that. I'm not in that position by choice. The point here isn't for me to tell you what to use your your imaginary money on or what type of balance you, you want to run with each brand. My point is to say that as part of the core concepts, as part of your gambling fundamentals, you need to be aware of and manage this imaginary money. Just as you would manage, in air quotes here, real money that's part of your gambling bankroll. You need, you need to be aware of this. You need to pay attention. You need to use it when you can. You need to make some decisions about this money just as you would other kinds of money. Casino Wisdom number 99 teaches, if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your gambling. This is one of the numbers you need to know. Another important number that you need to know is your tier score. These are the points that determine your benefits. You can usually check those on the casino website, at a kiosk in the casino, or by way of the casino's app if they have one. What I like to do as part of a casino visit is to take a picture of my current points with my phone before I start gambling. Then when I leave, I can compare that to my total, you know, whether it's at the end of the day gambling or it's when I leave the property on a longer visit. You know, the great example, we went to, we went to a Caesars property for a couple days, a uh, couple nights, several days, did a bunch of gambling just in the hotel room before we went down to the casino for the first time. I took a quick screenshot of my points. Mrs. TRG did the same thing. Then when we leave, we can see how many points we got for the gambling that we did. It's good technique to get a sense of how much gambling at a certain brand earns how many tier credits. It's that technique that allowed Gabriel and I to determine that gambling locally, we get a whole lot more tier credits for the same amount of time spent gambling at craps than we do spent gambling at blackjack. And I've been able to leverage that and use that information, and that's because we used this technique. Speaking of Gabriel, he's run into a couple of things recently that really highlighted this technique, this knowledge for both of us. First of all, his son recently received an, an, a mailer, a, a, a cardboard mailer from the local casino with some really nice offers in it. He mentioned it to his father, since he hadn't done any gambling in a, in a pretty long time. He hadn't been there in forever. And here's how his son ended up with offers he didn't play for. Gabriel and his son share the same first and last name. And after some checking, Gabriel's host confirmed that a pit boss hadn't swiped Gabriel's player's card to put him into a game. He had searched for him in the computer by name and selected Gabriel Angel Jr. by mistake instead of Gabriel Angel Sr., and that's the player that got put in the game, Gabriel Angel Jr. So he got all the points and benefits from that session at a craps table, a very long session. And at some level, it's okay. It's Gabriel's son. It's not some stranger. So his family can potentially get some value out of this action, out of the time he spent gambling. But his comps, including gift cards and free bets, are based on this level of play imaginary money that should have been his is now going to someone else. Those points going to someone else is taking value away from him. This is a mistake on the part of the pit boss. Gabriel and I both expect a less than professional top shelf uh, performance from our local casino. Once we get beyond the waitresses, bartenders, and, and dealers, it starts to get a little less than perfect. And it's frustrating. The way around this for Gabriel and the way around this for all of you is to try to remember to watch to see if your card is swiped when you start a new session at the table. This is not something that should be Gabriel's job. This is not something he should have to worry about, but it is unfortunately. And it's part of being a good casino gambler, of being good at casino gambling. It's technique that we all need to kind of pay attention to. It can become a subconscious thing. 
How do they handle my card when it comes in? I always try to pay attention to that. Like me, Gabriel usually checks his points when he enters the casino and then again after he's left. Last week, he discovered that after hours and hours of gambling, both at a craps table and at two blackjack tables, including one in high limit, he'd only received a handful of points. So after some phone calls and then a conversation the next day with a table game supervisor, it was determined that the pit boss at his craps table had only recorded Gabriel's time as around 20 minutes, not the three, four hours that he'd actually been there and been gambling. Not every casino is as poorly staffed as ours, but mistakes do happen. It's good casino gambling technique to make sure you get recorded accurately when you enter a table, especially if you switch tables. You don't have to make a big deal out of things. Just make sure your card gets processed when you enter. And if you switch tables, you can just say to the pit boss, I switched tables. Do you still have me in the computer? Do you still have me in the game? I've mentioned it before, you know, another aspect of this, and I've mentioned it before, but particularly at low stakes tables, it's also good to ask at some point in your session how they have you rated. If you're playing TRG Wagering System 1, it's easy for pit bosses to put you in based on your first bet of one unit and not see your two unit and four and a half unit bets. Often, if a session is going on for a long time, I'll ask, how do you have me rated? If they say something less than two units, I'll ask for an adjustment. If I've been so, you know, using our example, our common example of $10 units, I might say, I've been between $10 and $45 a good bit the entire time. I think something closer to $30 or $35 might be a, a more accurate rating for my play. Usually they're very happy to make the adjustment, and usually it's on the high end of my suggested range. You can see this is an important technique for being good at casino gambling. Managing how your points are entered at the table, making sure that your card is swiped, making sure it's swiped in a timely fashion when you come into the game, and managing your, whatever they call them, managing the imaginary money that they give you and using the imaginary money at, at, that they give you are all important aspects, all important things to keep in mind when trying to be good at the game of casino gambling. So there you go, Advanced Points Management 303. Let's call it that. It's a junior level class in casino gambling that we just had there. Next, we're going to do a moment of casino wisdom. For our moment of casino wisdom today, I wanted to share with you casino wisdom number 88. Casino wisdom number 88 teaches when gambling, mistakes happen happen. Let the dealers and the floor do their job. The action here seems pretty clear, right? Let the, let the people whose job it is to run the casino run the casino. But this is a casino wisdom with nuance and complexity when you understand it. I said at the start of the episode that this can either be a hero or a crook kind of wisdom, and it can be. Honestly, I usually use it from the crook point of view, and I'm going to talk mostly about that today, but let me talk about this from the hero point of view first. Let me give you an example that illustrates the hero side of this. When I gamble with Mrs. TRG, I'm often at a $15 table, since that's where she is most comfortable gambling if those tables are available where we are. So from time to time, I end up with a wager that includes red chips on top of green chips, right? I'm making that that press on the positive side. I've won two hands in a row. I'm going to one and a half units, so I'm making a bet with one green and two red chips as my next bet. In that situation, the dealers sometimes are working quickly. They're going to pay out the table. Maybe they busted and everybody else stayed, and they'll just grab a whole chunk of red chips, and they start going through paying by size. Everybody gets the right number of chips, and they don't realize that I need to be paid both red and green chips. They only pay me in red chips, and I end up being underpaid. It happened this weekend. I was paid three red chips instead of one green and two red chips. And I handled, handled this using this casino wisdom the way I always do. In this example, I leave my bet and what I was paid on the table, and I say, excuse me, could we renegotiate, please? I'd like a little more. It's funny it's polite, it's a light way to handle things, because then they look and, what is this idiot talking about? He wants to renegotiate his payout, and then they realize they paid me incorrectly. When this happened, as I said, the dealer always sees the problem, they correct my pay payout, 
Often they'll call over a floor and explain what happened. Um, this weekend he said, oh, I'm so sorry, my man. I, I didn't realize you were playing green. It's the start of my shift. I'll pay more attention. And of course I said it was no big deal and it wasn't. The house did their job. I used this wisdom and I just let them do their job and fix the mistake that had been made. But this is a wisdom with nuance. This same dealer was having not just a bad day, but a bad session. And maybe he was just having a bad day. Maybe he just didn't feel well. Maybe he was off. Maybe he was tired. He made a number of other mistakes. And when he did, we used this wisdom once again, but we used it as a crook, not as a hero. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. At one point, Mrs. TRG had a 7 and an 8, a total of 15 against a dealer's 10 showing. She gestured that she wanted a card. He handed her an 8 and announced, 21, good hit, and moved on to the next player. He didn't collect her cards or her wager, even though she had a total of 23. She had busted. She had lost. And she looked at me and she said, she just kind of whispered, is that 21? And I said, no. And at the time, I really thought he was just joking around. I thought he would collect her cards and her chips at the end of the hand. I thought he was just having a little fun. Instead, he paid her 23 just like he paid the other hands that had actually won. I think he ended up with like a total of 19, and he paid her 23 as if it was a 21. He made a mistake, and we applied this casino wisdom to the situation. A mistake had been made, and we let him do his job. His job is to see the mistake and correct it. It's also surveillance's job to uh, see this mistake and correct it. And I've seen that happen several times in, in my career as a casino gambler. The phone rings, the pit answers, they talk for a minute, and then the pit boss, the floor boss, the supervisor, whatever you want to call them, comes over and explains to the guest that a wager was incorrectly paid and needs to be returned. And obviously some players are not happy about that. I've seen players get angry about it. But it's also an example that's in another aspect. I told you this, this wisdom has nuance. Let the house do its job. And if that means returning something you shouldn't have been paid, that's fine. That's another aspect of this. But if you let them do their job and they let you keep the extra chips, that's fine too. There's nothing there for you to be upset about as a player. Back to my examples from this past weekend. And this one is, uh, well, it's another example of the same thing. And it's, it's fun. Same table, same dealer, I get a pair of sevens and the dealer has a six. So basic strategy, basic blackjack strategy says I need to split. So I add a second wager and gesture that I want to split my sevens to make two hands. My first card on the first hand was a three. So I add an additional wager to double that hand and I receive a five for a total of 15. And I wave my hand, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay there, and, and I'm going to move on to the next hand. And on the next hand, the second hand, I receive another seven. So I add another wager, and I split the sevens to create a third hand. On the second hand and the third hand, I receive a 10 for a total of 17. I stay on both of those, so three hands, a total of 15 and two 17s. The dealer turned over his face card to reveal a three for a total of nine, then dealt himself a seven for a total of 16, and a lot of times when dealers are doing this, they're calling out the totals as they go, both for themselves and for everyone else. But he wasn't doing that the way most dealers do. Maybe he was having a bad day. His next card was an ace, and he says 16, which is wrong. The total was 17. He should have stayed. But announcing 16, he quickly turns over a 10. He busts, and he declares the players a winner since the house busted. And all the players are smiling. We all know. I should have lost my first hand, which was a double. I should have pushed on the second and the third hand. I should have lost two units. As a result of his mistake, instead of losing two units, I gained four units. Ironically, right before this hand, shortly before this hand was played, I'd crossed my positive exit threshold. I was going to walk away with a profit. Losing two units in that situ situation would have had me leaving the table with a seven-unit profit. Instead, I added both to the win stack and the play stack, and we played a while longer before reaching our exit point and leaving the table with a nice profit before dinner. Plenty of gamblers in this situation don't let the house do its job. They don't let the house do its job and correct or not correct the mistakes. The players correct the mistake. I've played with, they'll point out, oh no, no, this should have been this. Oh no, no, this should have been that. I've played with people who will point out the mistakes, basically, as I said, not letting the house do its job. I've been told several times that not 
pointing out the mistake, not acting on behalf of the house to correct the mistake, creates bad gambling karma. I don't believe in gambling karma in the same way I don't believe in luck. And I could be wrong. In Greek mythology, Hermes was the god of both luck and gambling. So maybe he's sitting on Olympus somewhere, keeping score, and making sure TRG loses hand, hands that he shouldn't to make up for his ill-gotten gains. Maybe, but... Hermes is also a bit of a trickster, so maybe he's just amused by what I do instead of being angry and making me pay for it. Until I can confirm things with him, I'm sticking with my casino wisdom, and I'm letting the house do its job if a mistake is made that benefits me. Judge that however you want to judge it, and apply whatever aspect of this wisdom makes sense for you. <laughs> rats, rats, rats. That actually reminds me of another quick illustration of this. Um, I'm not going to do that now. I hadn't thought about it before. Uh, it wasn't part of what I was going to do here, but I'll tell you what. Bonus content. That's what it'll be. Bonus content. It's a quick story, so I'll do that one in the virtual VIP lounge later, along with the longer story about how this wisdom received its name, its title. So we'll do two stories at the end, but let's keep the episode moving along right now. I did some rambling last week, did some gambling while I was rambling. Let's talk about that next in a travel segment. <laughs> All right, well, unless I get sidetracked here and go off script, which happens fairly regularly, uh, this should be a pretty quick segment. Um, I, I kind of just told you, as part of our casino wisdom, some of the, the observations from, from our gambling this week. So let me kind of just run you through the week, run you through the facts. It was a busy casino week. It really was. Early in the, earlier in the week, I did a, my twice-a-month stop at one of our slot parlors in town, got some free play, made some free money, had a free lunch during the horse races and picked up a casserole dish on my way out the door. And when I left there, I stopped at my local casino for a free bet and a parking comp. Uh, I played a winning slot machine. I played one losing and two winning blackjack tables. And as a bonus, the second winning table created enough of a win that I was able to lock in a profit for the day and then take the rest of the money and go continue my craps education. I was just looking for one hot shooter to make me some additional money before I left. And amazingly, wonderfully, a lot of fun, that one hot shooter that I was looking for, it was me. It was actually me. I managed to throw four points, a bunch of numbers. I made a, you know, probably held the dice for 30, 40 minutes, made a bunch of money for people, made a bunch of money for myself. I'd even made a bet when I started my throw on how many points I would throw. It's a bet that once someone hits three, four, five, or even six points, the payout goes out. It's a side bet called a fire bet on our craps table. And so because I threw four points, after all the other money I'd won, then they gave me another stack of money to go with it. It was a lot of fun. It was a nice profit. And I made a second visit to my local casino later in the week, again receiving a free bet and free parking and um, free slot play. And I, and I, point, off, I point out the parking because since this casino is in a downtown area, parking is expensive in their lot if you don't gamble. So when they give me a parking comp, they're giving me a, a fair amount of value You know, when I, when I print that out. It, it's worth a fair amount of money. It would be expensive to park there all the time if I wasn't getting that comp. And that was me kind of going sideways trying to explain that. The free bet, the free slot play paid off nicely. I had one very small win at a blackjack table. I had two losing blackjack tables, but small losses, along with a loss on a slot machine as I was leaving. And those two examples, same casino, different days. It shows you you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days. And the idea is for the good days to outweigh the bad days. I've never told you I win every day. I never have told you that. I'm not about winning the day. I'm about winning the month and getting the free stuff and enjoying the casino lifestyle. We finished up the week on Saturday. Saturday's normally, often, unless I change my mind, the end of the casino combat week. Uh, on Saturday, we made a trip five and a half hours south and west to that wonderful Caesars Entertainment property that we love that has the great room service, great casino. We had a free bet and a food comp, Mrs. TRG had a a, uh, a free bet as well. Our room was only partially comp because it was Saturday night. That was a choice we made. For the evening, we each played a winning blackjack table, but we had, we had a one winning table, the one I was just telling you about where the guy made mistakes, but we had a win without his mistakes. And, and between the two of us, we had uh, four losing blackjack tables, and we each played a losing slot machine. 
just blackjack and slots, just the casino combat style gambling. We had a small loss for the week, easily made up by the comps and gifts we'd received. So a casino combat win. Add in the craps table win, which was done using profits from casino combat blackjack and a small craps table loss, and we made a few dollars for the week. So we made cash money gambling above and beyond our expenses. Cash and comps, it was a fun and profitable week. But in cash, it was less than a day's pay. Since we stayed in the resort until Monday, I'll have the rest of the results and observations for that visit in next week's episode, along with whatever gambling I do next week. So there we go. I told you that would be quick. Let's finish up in the virtual VIP lounge. I was going to do, I'm doing a quick story. Actually, no, let me check, change what I just said, right? I was going to do a quick story. I'm going to do two stories related to this episode's Casino Wisdom, and we're going to do that in the virtual VIP lounge. A little bit of the bubbly. Come on in. Our virtual VIP lounge is open as usual and right on schedule. As always, the best virtual everything virtually all the time, except the artisanal still water. Uh, I hear that isn't very good today, so maybe skip the artisanal still water. Uh, I got a bunch of running around to do as soon as I finish up behind this microphone. I'm going with the sparkling water for my sips today. Please don't mind me. Feel free to enjoy something stronger with me if you can, if you want to. That'd be great. I always enjoy my time with friends in real VIP lounges, having some drinks, telling some stories, gamblers talking to gamblers about gambling. One of my favorite things, one of the things I enjoy most. I'll get to the story that is kind of the origin or the crystallization of today's casino wisdom in just a second. But as I said, I'm going to jump off plan. I'm going to throw in an additional story that's always, it's, it's always in my mind, always stands out a little bit. Yeah, it's a common story for me to tell in VIP lounges and certainly a situation you are welcome to judge me negatively if that's how you see things on this story. You can certainly say that I did the wrong thing. Everybody's different. You do you, boo. But... I think it's fun, and I certainly appreciate it. So I'm traveling through Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, years and years and years ago on business. I was staying near their downtown casino, so I finished work, and I went over for the evening. And I hadn't hadn't at this point learned many of the core concepts. I hadn't gotten that far in, in my gambling journey yet. So I ended up spending hours and hours trying to win back money lost early in the evening. And it gets later and later, and my bets are getting larger and larger because I'm chasing that early loss and the time's getting away from me. It's it's early in the morning now. And I'm alternating between 25 bets with green chips and bets with black chips. Bet $25 units and $100 units. I'm going back and forth. I hadn't invented TRG Wagering System 1 yet. And at one point, I bet a stack of eight green chips, $200, and I win the hand. And the dealer pays me in black chips, matches them up, puts them right there. And I, and I take eight black chips, $800. And because I'd been playing both black and green chips, she doesn't call out that she's sending out eight black, which is a common call normally. But late at night, early in the morning, everyone's tired. A pit boss probably would have noticed and corrected the mistake if she'd made the call, but she didn't. This incorrect payout more than covered the loss I'd been chasing. I made one more bet of one green chip. I colored up my green chips. I didn't let her see or touch the black chips. I didn't let the coach know anything about those. I moved to the cage and out of the building very, very, very quickly. Certainly something learned from those crooks I read about as a youth. A youth? A youth. That's it. A youth. Um, As far as our main story for today goes, in this case, I tried to be a hero. And the house gave me no choice but to be a crook. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault at all, and it created a casino wisdom in the process. And this is another story where I think I'm being funny, I tell a TRG joke, and things go sideways on me unexpectedly. At the time, my local casino had just been open a few months. Everyone working for the house was pretty green, as often happens when gambling comes to a new state. I was playing low stakes blackjack, $15 table, $10 table. I was mostly just passing the time, enjoying the fact that there was now a casino close to my house. I don't remember what my hand was, it doesn't matter, but the dealer was showing, started off, the dealer showing a two, and when the dealer gets ready to play the house's hand, turns over an ace for a total of three or 13, since an ace can count as one or 11. And this is followed by a three for a total of six or 16, and then an ace for a total of seven or 17, and the rules of the game require the dealer at this property to take another card if they have seven or 17, you know, a soft 17. 
And so the dealer turns over a two for a total of 19 and the dealer announces she has 19 and I'm sitting, you know, at her right hand and I say, or 29. Again, this is a joke. I make this joke several times a year and everyone chuckles and the dealer says, ah, ha, 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 wish it could be. And that's the end of it. But the inexperienced dealer stops. She recounts and then she recounts again. And she said, oh, you are right. I'm so sorry. And I'm like, hey, hey I was just joking. But to my surprise, instead of processing that she says again no you're right you're right just a minute and she calls the floor person over she calls the pit boss over and starts explaining everything to him and i try to interject and explain that i was just joking but he stops and he looks me in the eye and he holds up his hand and he says sir i know you're trying to help but you need to wait let us do our job and i start i go but, but and he goes sir let us do our job so i did I shut up. What else could I do at this point, right? I mean, I've tried, tried to tell her, tried to tell him, tried to correct the situation my joke has, expect, has created, and he said, let us do our job. The other players at the table are all experienced players, and it's all they can do to not break out in laughter. We're all just holding it in, trying to keep a straight face while letting them do their job. We all knew we'd all lost, but the dealer and the floor person count the dealer's hand three more times. Then they call over another floor, floor person who counts the hand with them again. All three of them, all three employees doing their job, they all decide that our dealer does indeed have a total of 29. She has busted. And they paid the table and apologized for the delay. And we all just looked at each other and smirked and tried harder not to laugh. I remember the one guy on the opposite end of the table from me had been all in with his last $300. He'd stayed on a 14 against the dealer's two showing. He quickly, quickly, quickly left the table, got his money, and got out of the building before somebody could correct the mistake, before someone else doing their job could realize what had happened. From that day forward, anytime there is a mistake, I do. I remember this moment. I remember, sir, let us do our job. And that's what I do. I let them do their job. And I don't say a word if it benefits me or the other players at the table. That's how I handle things. As always, you make your own decisions. You be a hero, you be a crook, but I let them do their job. If you're playing the casino chip game, there are nine in this episode. Actually, I ad-libbed one with the youth thing. There are 10 in this episode. Please tip your waitresses, tip your bartenders, tip your dealers, but don't tip away your wins. I have spoken. Everything you heard here is true from a certain point of view. It's time for leaving, and I hope you understand I was born a rambling man. Love it. Hate it. It don't matter. Please share with your family and friends. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for listening, folks. I really appreciate it.